May all beings be happy, may all beings be healthy, may all beings be free from harm, may all beings love life, may all beings awaken. Welcome to another Kuk Audio Podcast with Tatsahara Stories. I'm DC Puba of Kuk Audio and Kuk Archives, preserving the legacy of Shunyu Suzuki and those whose paths crossed his. And anything else that comes to mind. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So today's Tassahara stories, it doesn't take place at Tassahara. It's one of them. It's just a story I felt like writing at that time and put in with that group, but it relates to characters who have been prominent in Tassahara's stories. Well, mainly Bob Halpern, but some others. So anyway, after our pause to meditate, we'll get right into it. So when you hear the bell, hit pause and meditate for as long as you wish. And when you're through with the meditation, hit unpause, and we'll be here with the bell to end the meditation. And we'll get right into today's Tassahara Stories. Rinpoche. You're drunk, Suzuki had scolded Bob drinking beer at the Hagiwara home where Suzuki went to do a family service. He didn't scold me at their home when I'd driven him. I think it was because I had just one on tap in a mug that was offered, and Bob probably overdid it with more of a flair for drama, even though he didn't even like to drink beer. Ha! As I'd learned in my experience with Japanese priests, alcohol is part of the Buddhist scene in Japan. There are priests who don't drink and austere lineages, but Japanese priests are known for their drinking, Most people in the Zen Center didn't know about that and only on a rare occasion would see Suzuki or Katagiri drink. Suzuki would soon fall asleep and Katagiri would get emotional. (laughs) At one party, he came up, hugged me, sat in my lap and said, I love you, David. (laughs) Suzuki was used to even revered Zen teachers drinking and at times to excess. He didn't like it but he didn't judge, and he pretty much re- disregarded Chogyam Trungpa's seemingly constant alcohol consumption. Trungpa had given a talk at the city center when Suzuki greeted him in the hall. He'd said, Hi, Roshi, I'm drunk, and then you can go now. <laughs> and he'd smoked and drunk while he gave his talk. Due to the quality of what he had to say, those who'd heard him couldn't easily dismiss him because of his habits. At that talk, an old Zen student named Henry Schaefer escorted Trungpa, who was not only tipsy, but somewhat crippled from smashing a car into a tree in Scotland where his first western center was. The dining room was packed for his talk, in which he continued to drink a clear liquid from a clear glass. Suzuki sat up in front of his students. 
After the talk, there were questions. Leland Smithson asked, if you put a mirror in a box, <laughs> will it reflect darkness? Trungpa said, you put the mirror in the box, you figure it out. <laughs> Someone asked why he drank and smoked, and Trungpa tossed it aside. David Schneider was a guest student and asked, shouldn't he protect himself by not having bad habits like we protect our eyes with sunglasses? Trungpa said, there's nothing to protect. There's nothing to protect. Afterwards, walking to his room, Suzuki, shaking his head, said to Bob Halpern, he's such a good teacher, if only people could see how he's teaching them. Bob asked me to come with him to a warehouse where he said Rinpoche was giving a talk. That's the respectful title people called Trungpa, as our teacher was called Roshi. Over 50 people sat and waited, mainly young, a lot of long hairs. Trunkpa was quite late, which I would learn was the norm for him, except at the Zen Center, where that wouldn't have worked well. He spent a long while just looking around and smiling, occasionally taking a sip from a glass. He spoke with a soft yet penetrating voice. He talked about how the practice was to be awake, to be fully with the moment, not to take any trip away from simply, not to take any trip away from simply being present. Please don't go on any trips, he said, and then he repeated, repeated, please don't go on any trips. There was an imploring quality to his voice. He repeated that many times with such earnestness it seemed he was about to cry. Suzuki said, don't go on any trips, too. And Bob and I noted that, nodding as if it had great import. Allen Ginsberg came in. Trunkpa commented on how we could see him now that he was clean-shaven. Turned out Trunkpa had been with Ginsberg before the talk and had chided him about his beard, so Ginsberg got rid of it. He carried a harmonium. Trungpa bid him to play us something. Accompanying himself, he sang a poem with the tagline about the hills, the hills. And when he was through, the room was silent. Everybody was looking at Trungpa. He gave Alan the finger and said, Fuck you. Ginsberg continued to be a student of Trungpa. Afterwards, Bob took me to an apartment where Trungpa was staying and sat up with him, drinking and smoking and talking. I told Trungpa I loved his book, Born in Tibet. Bob said he'd read it in 66 when it came out and carried it in his Satori shop in L.A. Bob said that Frank, with the big Adam's apple from Scotland, who'd studied with Trungpa there, had given the book to Suzuki the year before he and Trungpa met, and that he, Bob, had paid one of his uninvited visits to Suzuki one day, and that Suzuki had the book in his hand. Trungpa said that after he left Tibet, he never heard of his teacher again, and he felt so sad and alone, and then when he met Roshi, he felt that he had found a true friend. Trungpa said he liked being around Bob and me, because we reminded him of Suzuki. He said our problem was we were too serious. I went to pee, and Trungpa joined me. We peed together into the same toilet. Not many men in my culture would feel comfortable doing that, and I hadn't done that since I was a little kid with my father. I can even remember I'd look at the mole on my father's penis as we peed. I don't recall anything about Trungpa's penis, but I do recall going on about how lucky we were to meet great Dharma teachers and that where I'd come from, memorizing the capitals of the states was what we were taught. He said, memorizing the capitals of the states is the Dharma. Hmm. 
and his grasp of English, this man born and raised in Tibet, which he'd escaped 11 years previously in 1959, lived and studied in India till 1963 when he went to Oxford, had only been in America a year, and he imitated my Texas accent, which wasn't strong at all. Trungpa had said in his talk, there's no hope for us all. I brought that up and said that Bob and I had a comment on that, and Bob immediately joined me singing, There's No Hope for Us All, which we'd sung over and over many times driving together. There's no hope for us all. No hope for us all. We try so hard to do what we can, but there's no hope for us all. We only did one pass with Trungpa that night. I'd say it was well received and that he did not shoot us the bird or say fuck you. Trungpa was with others and Bob excused himself, saying he had to find someone to retire to Rinpoche's room with him for the night. I knew he'd slept with one woman who was there and asked what about her. Bob said, well, you know, it's hard to beat a new one. Before long, a woman I knew from the Zen Center came up to me and asked if I could tell her husband that she was spending the night with Rinpoche. I said, gulp, sure. They lived at the city center where I was headed off to. I got back pretty late and tapped on his door. He opened it bleary-eyed, and I told him his wife, was <laughs> his wife wasn't feeling well and would uh, be staying at the apartment where Trunpa was staying. The next day, she came up to me and was angry, asking why I'd lied to her husband. I told you to tell him I was staying with Rinpoche, and you told him I was sick, and he was really worried about me. I told her I was sorry, but I just couldn't bring myself to tell him she was going to sleep with another man. He's not just another man, she said. He's our teacher. So, this has been another episode from Tatsara Stories, The Early Years with Shunju Suzuki, a work in progress. I'm D.C. Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, coming to you from Sleepy Senor with Dog at Bandita, Feline Cuchita, and dear lovely Katrinka, and we're wishing you, and yours, and all of us, a grand awakening. Thank you.